Skype is a classic at this point. I say that because they're the original. The industry of online communication has exploded and Skype was the first big name associated with it. I don't think I'll ever separate the two in my mind. It even became part of our everyday language. You would say things like, uh, Skype me about it, or I'll Skype you later tonight. Actually, when I think about that, I don't feel like you hear those as often anymore. Is that how people perceive them? That they're on their way out, or at least not anywhere near the level they want were because I want to touch on that in this video. Skype has had an interesting journey that I want to break up into three distinct stages. In the first stage, they were independent, growing from nothing to a multi-billion dollar valued company. In the second stage, they were owned by eBay, and in the third stage, they were owned by Microsoft. That third stage might be the most controversial. So today, I want to talk about how they grew so large and where they stand today. But first, does anyone remember Kazaa? It was one of those distinct centralized peer-to-peer -peer music file sharing websites, very similar to Napster. They would connect people directly to each other rather than going through a centralized server. Simply put, they were all just ways for everyone to download music for free. Kazaa was created over in Europe by these two guys from Sweden and Denmark. Their names were not the easiest for me to say, but I'll give it a try. Niklas Zenström and Janas Freeze. All right, Niklas had a degree in business administration and engineering physics and spent three years working for a Swedish telecommunications company. So I'd say he had a good foundation for this. Kazaa was launched toward the beginning of 2001, actually only four months before Napster was forced to shut down. As you can imagine, the copyright laws attached to these songs made operating these companies very difficult. It was constant legal battles. By the end of 2001, Kazaa was dealing with the same same copyright issues. I imagine these two either didn't see much of a future for the company or simply didn't want to deal with the non-stop legal battles. So by the end of that year, they sold Kazaa to an Australian company called Charmin Networks. I know, <laughs> I really took a turn there. I should be talking about Skype and here I am talking about Kazaa. Well, here we go. The reason I've been talking about Kazaa is because right after they sold it, those two men went on to start Skype. And can I take a minute to point out the similarities between Kazaa in Skype, they both operate on this decentralized peer-to-peer -peer model. In both cases, there's nothing between the users, it's just a direct connection. In one case, the users, they're sharing their music, and then in the other case, they're just sharing their voices. In fact, the last two letters of Skype are short for peer-to-peer. -peer. The P-E part, it was originally referred to as Sky peer-to-peer, -peer, which was shortened to Skyper, and then of course down to Skype. If it was my decision, I think I would have stuck with Skype. Skyper. It has a cool sound to it, but I suspect they saw value in having that catchy one-syllable name. The actual service of Skype was first offered as a beta version in August of 2003 and was instantly a success. They had over a million registered users by the end of that year. It's because they had such a great business model that allowed them to grow. There was three main parts to it. I think that most would agree the most important part was offering their service for free. Just think, for any small business, they would be almost guaranteed to attract some customers by giving away their product for free. The obvious issue with that is you can't afford to give away too much of your product. But Skype didn't have to worry about that. The peer-to-peer -peer nature of their service meant they didn't have to pay for servers or bandwidth or whatever you would expect them to have to pay for. So unlike most businesses, they were able to serve additional users without adding additional costs, which proved to be a great way to build a strong user base. To go along with that, word of mouth ad advertising, it can be so effective, and this was a perfect service for it because it required two people to use it. Just an example, if you were going to call me later, maybe I'll recommend you download Skype and we could talk that way because it'll save us some money. That's it, right there, there's a new Skype user, and then maybe they'll tell someone else about it. Meanwhile, Skype is getting all this advertising for free. Also, for the third part, they did have some costs, they were a business after all, but they even had an alternative way to cover those. They would 
would pay for them by selling portions of the company to private investors. Now the new question is why would that private investor be interested? What would the payoff be for them? They invested with the promise that Skype would add paid services eventually and start collecting some money. The idea that the money's not here now, but it will be here soon. So to summarize all of that, for almost a year, Skype collected no revenue, but was able to build their user base to millions of people. Once they were established in July of 2004, they finally launched their paid service. It was called Skype Out, and it would allow customers to call people that weren't on Skype. Less than a year later, they launched the opposite service called Skype In, that allowed customers to receive calls from people that weren't on Skype. They still weren't profitable, but now they were bringing in millions of dollars in sales. And that's better. Those sales, along with their rapidly growing user base, attracted the attention of eBay, which leads us to our second stage. In 2005, Skype was acquired by eBay for $2.6 billion. Half of it in cash and the other half was in eBay stock, which I have to admit sounds a little pricey for a two-year-old company with sales of around $60 million that wasn't even turning a profit. $2.6 billion? That's hard to justify. But as I said, they were growing fast, so they must have figured it was worth the premium. Also, they felt confident that they they'd be able to integrate it into their online auctions, sort of opening communications between the buyers and the sellers and hopefully making the process run a little smoother. PayPal is the other company that comes to mind. eBay bought them a few years earlier with similar intentions of integrating it into their auctions and making the process run smoother. I wouldn't say this worked out in the way they envisioned. Here, when you buy something on eBay, do you really want to talk to, or for heaven's sake, video chat with the person who sold it to you? <laughs> Why would you, really? Just talk through emails and that's enough. Those emails proved to be the preferred method for eBay communications, so Skype didn't turn out to be especially valuable for their service. Then in 2009, four years later, eBay sold about 70% of Skype to a private investment firm called Silver Lake Partners for the price of $1.9 billion, which did value the company at around $2.75 billion, which is similar to what they bought it for. So, yeah, a similar price, but it is after four years of growth. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that they did overpay when they bought it. Talking about overpaying is a good transition into their third stage because in 2011, Microsoft bought 100% of Skype for the price of uh, $8.56 billion in cash, valuing them at over three times higher than the deal two years earlier. It was actually Microsoft's largest acquisition until they bought LinkedIn in 2016. When this deal happened, most people were saying that they seriously overpaid for it. And from a financial standpoint, it's hard to argue. The year before, Skype did have $860 million in revenue, but it resulted in an $8 million loss. Still. Skype did not make any money. From the beginning, they always did a good job in generating business, but it always had a hard time turning a profit. It helped them build almost $700 million in debt as well, so it made everyone question why Microsoft saw them to be so valuable. At the time of the sale, Skype CEO, who was then in charge of that division under Microsoft, said, together we will be able to accelerate Skype's goal to reach 1 billion users daily. That was a far off goal because they were currently at about 65 million monthly users, so that makes me think that the premium was based on expected growth from the free service, which among other things can potentially translate to more paying customers, which was somewhere between 8 and 9 million per month at the time. Another reason for the acquisition was to complement Windows Live Messenger, formerly called MSN Messenger. In 2011, it actually had far more active monthly users than Skype, somewhere around 300 million. Soon after the acquisition, they made it possible for the users of the two services to communicate with each other, and then two years later, they discontinued Windows Live Messenger and sort of shoved all those users onto Skype. They also did a very similar thing with Link. It was a similar service, but specialized for business use within a company. Microsoft integrated the two, and then in 2015, rebranded Link as Skype for Business. And then now, Skype for Business is being replaced by Microsoft Teams, and <laughs> that's a whole other thing. What about Windows Phone? 
iPhone 7, their phone operating system that was another potential use for Skype. Earlier in that same year, Microsoft had announced that Nokia phones would primarily use it, and then two years later, they actually acquired Nokia altogether. It was all considered to be a bit disastrous, but maybe integrating the Skype app into those phones in some way could be a good way to utilize it. It's also a popular belief that they bought Skype partially as a defensive move. Google, Facebook, Cisco were all thought to be considering it, so Microsoft came in and took it for themselves before any of them had a chance. When it comes down to it, the purchase was a bit of a gamble, but they had some unique uses for it and some high expectations when it came to growing their user base. I don't have a perfect answer as to whether or not it was a smart decision by Microsoft, or eBay for that matter. I can say that they did both help grow the Skype name, but maybe not enough. I can see how some would consider this a failure. Think back, throughout their existence, all three stages, there were high hopes for Skype. People were buying into this company for far more than it was worth at the time because they always saw future potential. In the beginning, it was these private investors, then it was eBay, and then it was Microsoft. Every one of them were criticized for paying too much at the time. And in reality, I don't think it ever has met that sky-high potential. The current estimates have them at about 300 million monthly users, which is still nowhere near that optimistic goal of 1 billion per day set years ago. And quite honestly, I can't even imagine them ever reaching that mark. I think the real issue with Skype today is they're missing out on market share. Like I said in the beginning, online communication services have been exploding. Skype was the original. They had a tight hold on that market for years, but not as much today. As the market grows and more users enter it, they're missing out on potential customers more often than not. Whichever service you use, is probably dependent on what you're using it for. There's so many of them. WhatsApp from Facebook is ridiculously popular. They also have the Messenger app. There's Viber, Slack, Duo, Discord. Even Apple's FaceTime app or their iMessages can be considered competitors. Now instead of one real choice, there's 50 of them. So it's not that Skype has fallen or is on the brink of shutting down, but rather it's that they failed to keep up with the others and it appears lower in relation. <laughs> but really, with all these apps made available with all these different features optimized for different uses and integrated into different things, I don't see how Skype could have possibly maintained their position over them. Maybe, just a thought, if they had introduced a bunch of specialized apps, just one called Skype Gaming or Skype Friends or, you know what I'm saying, branch out and expand with the market. Since this is proven to be a very wide subject, I want to include a few extra things for you to consider related to why the Microsoft stage has been so controversial. First off, I don't want this to turn into a customer service review, but Skype users have been getting upset with the service. All of these rebrandings and mergers with their other various websites have resulted in constant changes in the interface, many times seemingly for no reason. And then people have been forced into creating Microsoft accounts. It's a popular opinion that the service has become more complex, yet less reliable. Also, I should mention that Skype no longer uses that once important and peer-to-peer -peer system. Soon after Microsoft took control, they essentially switched it over to their centralized servers, which has led to a scandal involving the interception of user data. So those are just a couple reasons why Skype users may not be thrilled with Microsoft's involvement. Let me know in the comments, what do you think about Skype today? And what do you see for the future? Are they gonna go up or down? And what do they need to do if they wanna rise back to the top of their industry? Also, are you a Skype user? Or or have you been one in the past? Maybe you just use them less now because you're using some of the others in addition to it. So what were your peak Skype years? I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.